Last week, Anna Hilliker launched our final summer series on the parables of Jesus with a deeper look at the parable of the two builders. And if you weren't able to join us last week because you were out of town or your children had a sports tournament or you were getting matching tattoos with your coworkers, you missed a great sermon. And you can find both video and audio resources on our website under the resources tab. Now, at the start of the summer, we had a sermon series on judgment, exploring the ways we tend to harm our relationships through postures which withhold mercy. We followed that series up with a look of how we are to be neighbors to those who are around us. And in our time together this morning, we'll be looking at Luke's recorded parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Because I believe that this story, like many stories, has more to offer us than what we've perhaps assumed before. Now, before we dive into our story, I'd like to contrast two different approaches to the biblical parables to help us engage more deeply with these stories of Jesus. Kenneth Bailey is a professor, author, and researcher at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. And Bailey reminds us that parables serve as metaphors, and that a metaphor's purpose is not to merely illustrate a theological picture, but rather to invite the hearer into discourse, into conversation and examination, into reflection and into imagination, so that the metaphor can teach us again and again and again. Now, in my experience, the more prevalent understanding of Jesus' parables have been similar to that of a bullet casing, whose sole purpose is to drive the shell in the direction of a target after which it can be discarded. And many of us have fallen into this trap, understanding biblical parables as only serving to launch an idea or a single concept forward in our spiritual walk, and then once we've hit our target, we can discard the story, rendering it as no longer important or relevant or timely. Now, Anna touched on that a little bit last week where we examined how the simplicity of the two builders' parable is often filed away and dismissed as a children's story, despite its incredible challenge. And I find this bullet analogy to be helpful, not only because it can serve to illustrate our common errors of interpretation, but also it reminds us that such postures are detrimental to our spiritual health, in much the same way that an actual bullet is a threat to our physical health. And so I think in such a case, a violent comparison could be considered appropriate. But Bailey has another recommendation for how we might think about parables. He suggests that metaphors do more than explain meaning, but rather they create meaning. A parable is an extended metaphor, and as such, it is not a delivery system for an idea, but a house in which the reader or listener is invited to take up residence. And as we'll see, in just a moment, that there are many rooms and viewpoints for the rich man and Lazarus story. So one or more of these themes might be something that we care about, themes of justice and injustice, of being blessed or being cursed, of compassion and ignorance, of self-preservation versus self-indulgence, wealth and poverty, family, race, belonging, inside, outside, status, so much in here. And so assuming that we care about at least one of these themes, let's get to our text this morning. We're in Luke chapter 16 for the story, and it reads like this. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Bosom, that's a great word. (laughs) And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so he may dip the tip of his finger in water. And cool off my tongue, for I am in agony and fire. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise, Lazarus bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed, so that none who wish to come over from there to here will be able, and none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. 
But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Ooh. There's a lot to get into this morning. If only I had three hours up here. But let's get started. <laughs> so as I was growing up, the bullet point of this parable was reduced for me to be a simple turn or burn story. It's a warning, right? It's the don't hold your cash or you'll turn to ash. It's the ignore a fry man, enter the enter, ignore a poor man, enter the frying pan. It's the if your heart is hard, you'll get charred. If you <laughs> You reject the Holy Ghost, you'll end up toasty. <laughs> I could do this all morning, folks. <laughs> now, this parable is certainly a cautionary tale, among other things, but the challenge and the inspiration of the story can be lost on the strong follow Jesus or else theme that I had walked away with. And I've come to believe that such a gross application at the end of the day only dismisses the real power of the story and had invited me to rest in the assurance that I was nothing like the rich man. Because if there are any gates in rural Indiana where I grew up, they were to keep cows out, not beggars out. So a lot of this story was lost on me growing up. So putting my traditions of self-righteous judgment on the curbside where they belong, let's take a couple of considerations forward with us as we look at the story. A primary consideration is that it's the only parable of Jesus where we have a character that is named all other characters and all of Jesus' other parables have generic labels like worker, master, servant, builder, Pharisee, and so forth. But in this story, the name Lazarus is given to the beggar. In the Hebrew language, the la name Lazarus means the one who God helps. And this would have really stuck in the minds of the original listeners who would have likely read his introduction like this. A poor man named the one who God helps, was laid at his gate, covered with sores and longed to be fed with the crumbs that were falling from the rich man's table. Now, unsurprising to you and I, because a reaction might very much be the same, the earlier listeners would have been caught up in this naming. Like, really? God helps this guy? No. No, God certainly does not help this man. This sounds like a cruel joke, an awful twist of fates. Why, in all of the names you could have chosen Jesus in this world, including your own, did you name him Lazarus? Especially in contrast with the man who has it all. Because the picture that Jesus paints of the rich man isn't a commonly rich man. His wealth was above and beyond what even in wealthy societies would be considered excessive. To illustrate this, Jesus described the man's attire as wearing purple and fine linens daily. Now, purple dyed fabrics were difficult to produce at this time and would have been very expensive. If a person uh, was fortunate enough to own purple clothing, it would only be worn at the absolute best of occasions. To wear purple daily would be our cultural equivalent of a man wearing a designer tuxedo every day. So we can appreciate the lavish picture that he's painting. Jesus also describes the man as wearing exceptionally fine linens, which would have essentially been describing the man's underwear. A lot of people miss this, but Jesus is quite funny. As if the rich man were not wildly extravagant in and of himself to the point that he would wear purple every day, he also wore luxury underwear. Only something cush for this man's tush. In stark contrast... Lazarus' existence could be considered textbook definition of cruel, of unfair. Not only was he painfully crippled, but was ignored every day by those who had the means to save him. It would even appear that the neighborhood's stray dogs were conspiring against his happiness, as several translations phrase it in such a manner, noting that besides even, the dogs were coming, and even the dogs came, and moreover, the dogs came. But rather, the Greek here denotes a contrast. Being carried to and from the rich man's gate and getting licked by stray dogs were actually the only notably helpful things this man has experienced in his life. 
Dogs were culturally despised as well. Even today in the Middle East, dogs aren't really pets. They're scavengers. They're dirty and kind of dangerous and definitely unwanted. And the story, not even the lowest person, but the lowest animal is the only steady comfort this man received. Now, if your next question is, why would a dog licking him be comforting? Allow me to do a quick tangent. There was, at this time, ancient healing cults that were popular in surrounding countries where dogs were considered to be actually sacred. And injured persons would take their money to a priest or priestess, and they would let puppies lick your ouchies. Now, it is true that there are properties and canine saliva that can indeed promote healing, but it's also true there's some really gnarly bacteria in there that can make you really sicker than what you were to begin with. So eh, that's a hit or miss as to whether it works. Um, but here at the church, we, we don't officially recommend puppy kisses as uh, legit home remedies. Now, there is debate as to whether or not Jesus was alluding to such cults, which operate outside of the Jewish law and custom, or if he was simply declaring a contrast between Lazarus' potential care and his actual care. But that's something we can speculate on later. So then where is God's goodness and his favor in this story? Are such blessings only for the next life? Lazarus' name was the same in both lives, so I feel like there has to be something more. And I think we got a glimpse of that in the interactions between Abraham, who was holding Lazarus, and the rich man, who was in torment. Now, to be cradled in Abraham's bosom conjures a vivid image for the listener, because there are very few people that we would just, like, cradle to our chests. And this posture is far more intimate than a mere hug, the best way to understand this posture is to imagine a new parent holding their child. The embrace doesn't just convey a, we're cool, sentiment, or a, you mean something to me. But such an embrace conveys that you couldn't be any closer to me if you tried. It speaks of safety and warmth, of love and acceptance, of dignity and hope to its recipient. And what a sweet message that must have been for a man who longed every day for his basic needs to be met. Now, it's not an embrace that says you can have breadcrumbs. That is an embrace that says, I will buy you tacos forever. That is a good embrace. And now at this point in the story, we begin to see the first verbal exchanges, initiated by the rich man who has found himself in a form of torment while Lazarus is resting with the patriarch of their faith and their people. And it's really not what we might have expected. As the wealthy man sees Lazarus in the company of Abraham, he asks Abraham to send Lazarus to bring him relief. This was a wild request, considering how each have kind of fared in their own judgment, where the rich man has the expectation that Lazarus should still serve him and be below him. After Abraham diplomatically tells him, not going to happen, man. The rich man then requests that Abraham send Lazarus to his brothers to warn them. Still not taking the hint that he's in torment for being a jerk, he still wants Lazarus to run a personal errand for him. Abraham again, in defense of Lazarus, asserts that his brothers have adequate warnings for how they live their lives, and that even if he were to send Lazarus, they would not believe him. Now let the reader understand that Abraham is not giving up on the rich man's family by withholding Lazarus, but rather is judging their posture. If the rich man is unwilling to see Lazarus as significant, even from the depths of his own judgment, the likeliness that his brothers would repent is slim to none. Even if Lazarus were to appear to them, they would still fail to see him too. Now, within the Christian faith, there's a lot of this talk about this idea of being saved. And it's been for me a mixture of confusion and excitement. I'd always known how to answer the question so that people would leave me alone. But inside of my head, I always wondered, like, saved from what, right? Like, if people are asking me if I'm saved from hurricanes or polar bears, my answer is yes. I live in the Midwest. Those jerks can't touch me. I'm safe here. But when I was younger, getting saved wasn't about submitting myself so much to the lordship of Jesus. It was more about being accepted by my peers and by my family. And the blessing wasn't in being saved through the rigors of discipleship, but being saved from harassment or exasperated looks when I didn't feel like going to church or I was a little too rambunctious. 
Sometimes I still want salvation from those things. But when we consider the theme of salvation in this story, it takes us to a curious places where we ask questions like, is salvation for now or is salvation for later? Both? If Lazarus experienced salvation on earth, on earth, how? What did he do or not do to experience it? And I suspect that in examining Lazarus' response, or lack of response, rather, to the rich man, we discover a clue. See, I'm frequently frustrated by injustice. And if you're willing to look for it, it's not difficult to find. And if I were to put myself in Lazarus' position, I would have given the rich man a verbal beatdown from across that chasm. And perhaps Jesus' audience would have been surprised by this as well, that Lazarus did not explode at that pompous jerk who has the audacity to request to use him as an errand boy after years of neglect and mistreatment. I mean, come on. This was your chance, Lazarus. Let him have it. Put that disgrace of a neighbor in his place. Shut him up for good then drop the mic, walk away. You know we'd all cheer. We would love it. We'd rally. Like, you really want to offer him an anger translator. I mean, like, Barack Obama has this Luther character, so why can't Lazarus have a little more backup for his outrage? Abraham was firm, but a little too, too controlled for my taste. We just want to see someone cut loose to come down on this literal fancy pants and destroy him but he doesn't. He doesn't. And what I'm going to wager is that the reason behind Lazarus holding his tongue is because he truly loved his neighbor, both in his earthly life and while by Abraham's side. Because there's more to a beggar who returns to a wealthy man's gate every day when he's likely to receive nothing. There's more to his request for proximity without any positive history or promise of help. Lazarus displayed an incredible belief in the rich man's ability to change. He had a wild hope in his ability to be more than a tuxedo-donning narcissist. Lazarus chose to believe the best about his neighbor, despite the evidence, and loved him in his entire life without abandoning him. All the while, the rich man and his brothers abandoned Lazarus daily. When you read Paul's description of love to the early church in Corinth, we can recognize Lazarus' posture towards the rich man. And the infamous love chapter in 1 Corinthians reminds us that love is patient. Love is kind and not jealous. It does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Interestingly enough, Ken Bailey noted that love both begins and ends with applications of patience. Now, a quick mathematical note about this story. The man's number of brothers was significant because if you added him into the mix, it would create a family of six brothers. Now, in Jewish understanding, six was a negatively associated number for several reasons. But one of the reasons it was poorly favored was that because it falls one short of the number seven, representing perfection. Had the rich man and his brothers taken in the man outside their gate, the achievement would have been numerically noted as being perfect in the story. Lisa Sharon Harper, the author of The Very Good Gospel, reminds us that the Hebrews understood perfection not as existing inside the thing, but rather existing between things. Perfection should not be understood as happening only on the other side of this life, but in between. That would mean the idea of being saved is something that doesn't just happen later, but also must happen now. You see, Lazarus' name worked. God did help Lazarus. God did save him in his physical life. If we were to imagine our love verses as frameworks of salvation, we can perhaps better see why Lazarus was named the one who God helps. If I were to paraphrase 1 Corinthians 13, our salvation is from impatience, from cruelty and jealousy. 
Salvation is protection from our own egos and forgiveness for our own missteps. We're saved from selfishness and provocation, saved from revenge and the delight of things that are always negative. Loving salvation invites us not only to bear all things, but also to believe, hope, and endure through all things. Lazarus was saved from such things. To follow Jesus invites us into the midst of a backwards-leaning tribe where we love our enemies, where we pray for those who make our lives miserable, where we see the blessed are those who mourn, those who are poor, and those who are weak. We're to be a tribe where we go the extra mile with a joyful heart, even when the first mile was super annoying. This parable keeps us rooted as followers of Jesus in our hope to experience salvation and to extend it towards our neighbors. Such perseverance grows in us a richness that this world is desperately craving. It is a richness that knows love and peace and goodness and shares them freely with any who might receive it. We sow seeds of compassion, of patience, of endurance, because we know that they yield transformation not only in our lives, but in the lives of those we love. And this parable is, again, sowing seed. It sows seeds of simplicity, of generosity, and of empathetic action. And the beautiful thing about this love is that it's right here, right now. Because for each of us, being saved can mean something more than what the Christian t-shirt and bumper sticker industry had turned it into. Because you see, what we do with our physical, our material things matters. The value is made clear because in our parable, not only would the material kindness have aided Lazarus, but the character transformation on behalf of, on behalf of the rich man would have had a far-reaching impact on his character and influence. And as we wrestle with the stories and the images from the biblical text, some things began to stand out to us. Across the Bible, we see a lot of images being painted corresponding to how we live our lives. Jesus talks to the Pharisees, comparing them to cups, where they're clean on the outside, but kind of gross on the inside. And every time I hand wash a cup, I think about that. Or he uses this analogy of breaking bread, representing his body being broken for us. And I can't go to an Italian restaurant and indulge in a huge loaf of crispy, fresh bread without thinking about that imagery. It hits me. And in this way, everyday things have the opportunity to become, become icons or symbols of something greater than themselves. And so my question becomes, if we can become patient in accepting the imperfections of our stuff, how much more can we be patient with the imperfections of our families? If we can be generous with our material goods, how much more then could we be generous with our immaterial goods, such as our time, our attention, or our kind words? If we can identify clutter in our material lives, could we identify the clutter in our spiritual lives, such as weeding out our imbalances of television so that our calendar has space to open up new friendships, or deleting phone apps that distract us from conversation, or perhaps offering that second lawnmower in your garage to the new couple that just bought their first house. And this is going to lead us into our practical tips today. First one for you, for us. Identify a possession of yours as an icon to remind you of your commitment to find the good in difficult places and to practice patience. Now, my icon is currently an electric weed eater that I've wanted to replace for seven years. I hate it. It's annoying. I have to take a 75-foot extension cord out of my garage, untangle it, plug it in, and drag it everywhere so that the city of Ypsilanti doesn't find me for having a hideous lawn. On top of that great annoyance, I also have to stop about twice through my work session in order to draw more wire out of the coil. What could be done in five minutes with a perfectly fine $100 gas weed trimmer takes me at least 15 minutes. But it works. And my yard looks good when I use it. I do not need to spend $100 to replace it. It reminds me to practice patience when I'm frustrated. 
So find your icon and embrace it. Second practical tip, clean out your garage, attic, basement, or wherever the place is in your life that you store your junk. In other words, simplify. And here's the romantic way to do this. It'll look like this. The romantic journey is 10 dates, five breakups, and one marriage. 10 dates. You pick 10 items of yours that you seldom use, and you write today's date on it with a sticky note or a piece of paper, or a piece of tape. If you haven't used it in a year, get rid of it. This is best for those items you really like, but you're not sure if you have a future together. Next one is you initiate five breakups. You pick five items that aren't doing you any good and end your relationship. And remember that breakups are often painful, so there are two rules that come with this. One, no rebounding. You're not allowed to replace the items you break up with to numb any pain. And two, no take backs. It's not you, it's them. And your third suggestion is a marriage. Marry off one of your treasures to someone who needs it more. This is the equivalent of walking your material goods down the aisle to unite them with someone else. Give away something valuable that you love to someone else. You can even dress up for the occasion. Your item of choice would prefer it that way and you'll look very attractive in the wedding pictures. And your third practical tip set is we recognize that this parable invites us to do a lot of heart work. Exploring our own postures towards those who act unjustly, unkindly, or who don't know how or care to live generously to the benefit of their neighbors. Our posture is not to be one of condemnation or smug separation, but rather one of humility, choosing to align ourselves with Christ. So your invitation is to reimagine Paul's description of love alongside me and invite God to continue working out his salvation in your life. And you can do this in a couple of ways. One, spend time reading this morning's parable this week and enter into a theological house with fresh eyes. Read the short parable three times this week and invite the Holy Spirit to move. Or if you want to aim for perfection, read it seven times. Just kidding. Unless you really want to. Second idea is to apologize to someone that you've been trying to fix or that you've written off as being a lost cause for change. Third option would be to join our prayer ministry team down here to my left at the end of the message to accept God's gift of salvation for the first time. Maybe this is stuff you want. Maybe it's something you need. Maybe that's hitting you this morning. Come pray with us. See what God's doing there. And then finally, is repent from any rich man tendencies. Whether it may be an unhealthy relationship with our resources, our unwillingness to see the value of another, or an era of entitlement to God's favor. We're going to take time for communion and offering. We're heading back to Sean. I think you're all set, man. All right. All right.